So I'm excited to talk to you guys today about a project that is um, our sort of like the, the most recent thing that I've been working on. We don't have a preprint yet, although I'm hoping in the next week or two uh, it will finally be uh, ready for the light of day. Um, and I should say in terms of questions, uh, I'm very happy for people to ask questions uh, along the way. I'm used to teaching MBAs, uh, so you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so any, any, any question at any point, feel free. Um, okay, so unfortunately, the topic of misinformation is something that doesn't need a ton of introduction. Uh, obviously, falsehoods have been around as long as communication has been around, but in the last eight years or so, there's been a particular form uh, of misinformation that has been getting a lot of attention starting during the 2016 election cycle uh, of claims that are false, uh, but presented as if they're sort of legitimate uh, news claims and that often are spreading uh, online. And so there has been um, a lot of public concern about this and a lot of uh, pressure on technology companies to figure out how to reduce the spread of misinformation. Um, and similarly, a lot of academic research on what to do about it. And the, the current state of the art is uh, there's sort of two main things that uh, tech companies are using in trying to combat misinformation, um, which is they try to identify claims that are false or misleading, either using some combination of professional fact checkers and machine learning classifiers. And then once they've identified something as problematic, uh, they either can demote it in the newsfeed so people are just less likely to see it, which more or less by definition works, or they can uh, put warning labels on it. And you might be skeptical about how effective a warning label is, but actually there's a lot of evidence that uh, fact checker warning labels work. Um, if you put a label on something saying that it's false, uh, people are going to be less likely to believe it and less likely to share it. Uh, we had this review article recently. Um, we find across studies you get maybe a 25 to 50 percent reduction in belief and sharing if you put a label on it. Um, and there's basically no evidence of backfires. You might worry that if somebody believes something and you put a warning label on it, they'll get mad and they'll believe it even more. But there was like one study once that found that and then nobody else ever found it again. Uh, but it really stuck in people's heads. But it's, you know, don't have to worry about backfires. Like warnings are good. And I should say the QR codes are links to papers if you want to read more about the stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of the state of the art. And, uh, in general, you know, demotion works and, uh, and, and warning labels work. And the, with the problem with them is not something about it not working. The problem with, uh, with these approaches and with warnings, but you know, more, more generally with these kind of content-specific interventions where you identify a piece of content as problematic and then you take action against it, the problem is coverage and speed. So <clears throat> there's so much content online that particularly for professional fact checkers, they just can't check everything. And they can't even check a tiny fraction of the th stuff that is posted. And when things do get uh, evaluated, it often takes, uh, it's slow. Um, I think a, a, a stat that Facebook put out a couple of years ago was something like an average of two days between when something is posted and when it's flagged. Sometimes it can take you know, weeks. Uh, and so obviously, if something gets identified and then demoted or, or flagged, but it's already been up for days, that's not going to do anything, because basically everybody that was going to see it has already seen it. So uh, the question is that, or the question that I've been particularly interested in in recent years is what can we do to kind of complement these content-specific interventions? And in particular, what are content-neutral interventions that we can do? So things where you don't need to know anything about the specific content that people are seeing in order uh, to get them to be less likely to share it. And the work that I'm going to talk about today takes a particular approach uh, to this kind of content-neutral intervention um, that's built on insights that we have had around a, at least a good chunk of why people share misinformation. And so the basic idea is that social media is an extremely distracting environment where uh, you know, you're scrolling quickly through your news feed, uh, your, the news is intermixed with you know, baby pictures and cat videos and funny memes and all this different kind of stuff that is uh, sort of emotionally arousing and also things where like accuracy just is not a salient concept. You know, how accurate is this cat meme is like not a relevant concept. Uh, and so 
uh, you know, the, your attention is not directed at accuracy, and you're given all these social signals. You're seeing who shared it, how many likes it got, how many comments it got, all this kind of stuff. And so because you're scrolling quickly and you're distracted, you have limited sort of attentional resources, and those attentions are that attention is directed at things other than the concept of accuracy. So even if you're someone who doesn't want to share inaccurate things, and so you've got a preference that says, if it's inaccurate, I don't want to share it, you don't wind up acting on that preference a lot because you just forget to think about it because you're thinking about all this other stuff. Um, and so what this lens on uh, misinformation sharing suggests is simply getting people to consider the concept of accuracy, just sort of shifting attention to accuracy, will lead you to uh, be more discerning in your sharing, and in particular will make people less likely to believe, uh, or sorry, less likely to share uh, false claims, and in particular less likely to believe, to share claims that if they thought about it, they would realize were not true. So like, if there's some falsehood that's widely believed, this isn't gonna help, because people will think about it, say, oh yes, it's accurate, and share it anyways. But there's a lot of claims that uh, people are sharing that uh, if they thought about it, they would realize are not true. And in particular, the social media context kind of selects for uh, stuff that's a little bit sensational or salacious or whatever that doesn't pass like a little gut check because that's what makes it spread. Like if it, you could make up truths, or sorry, you could make up falsehoods that everyone would think is true, but they would be totally boring and no one would ever want to share them. And so like the same, the same thing that gives a lot of the fire to, uh, you know, sort of, successful uh, false or misleading claims is what would make you realize on reflection, eh, well, maybe this is kind of fishy. Um, so we've run a lot of uh, survey experiments uh, testing this kind of, um, this proposal. Uh, and so we've looked at a lot of different ways of directing people's attention to accuracy at the beginning of the study. Um, a thing that we've done the most is what we call like a sort of evaluation prompt, where at the beginning of the study, we say, you know, first we want to pretest a news headline for future studies. We're interested in whether people think it's accurate or not. We show them one non-political headline, and we just say, in your opinion, how accurate is this headline? And then they go on to the main task where we show them a bunch of uh, posts like this and say, how likely would you be to share it? And but the idea is because we asked them about accuracy once at the beginning, it primed the concept of accuracy, and so they're more likely to think to themselves on the subsequent posts, oh, well, how accurate is that? Um, and uh, across a bunch of these studies, um, well, actually, like, uh, we, we consistently find that this makes people less likely to share the false claims. We've also done it using sort of minimal digital literacy tips, um, like this uh, card here. Uh, this is from a paper that Zivi Epstein, who's a postdoc here, was the, was the lead on. Um, I think these tips don't really teach anybody anything that they didn't know already, but just reading it makes you think about accuracy and be like, oh yeah, I guess I should pay attention. You can ask people how important is it to them to only share accurate content. Most people will say very important or extremely important, and then they'll go on to be like, oh yeah, uh, I guess I should be thinking about that. Um, you can also tell people that other people think that it's important to show, only show accurate content. Um, and so, as I said, we've run a lot of experiments of this structure, and we had this paper uh, a couple of years ago where we did a sort of meta-analysis of 20 different experiments that we ran with over 26,000 uh, American participants in which each of them had a control condition where people just went through a bunch of actual posts, some true, some false, and said whether they would share it, or a treatment where something was done at the beginning to prime them to think about accuracy, and then they did the sharing task. Uh, and we find that, on average, they're uh, prompting people to think about accuracy at the beginning, uh, reduced the sharing of the false, uh, or the sharing intentions of the false claims by about 10% and had no effect on the true claims. And an important thing to emphasize here is that these accuracy prompts aren't giving any people n any new useful information. It's not telling them anything about the specific pieces of content. It's not telling them what's true or what's not true. It's just activating the concept of accuracy in their mind, shifting their attention to accuracy such that then they sort of, you know, using their own facilities, essentially, think about it more uh, afterwards. So we found that it works for political headlines you agree with, political headlines you don't agree with, COVID headlines. Uh, it works for conservatives and for liberals. Uh, and we, we, worked, we like have like hundreds of different headlines across all these different experiments and like dozens of different ways of prompting people to think about accuracy. And we sort of consistently find these effects. 
Uh, we also had a paper we published last year where uh, we did a cross-cultural study. So we used statements about COVID-19 that were relevant everywhere in the world. Um, and we looked at 16 different countries. Uh, and we did the same uh, sort of procedure. And we find similarly, on average, across countries, there was like a 9.4% decrease in sharing intentions for false claims when you prompted people to think about accuracy, no effect on true claims. Um, and then we also uh, had a, a sort of small-scale Twitter field experiment where uh, we found about 5,000 users that had shared links to low-quality uh, news sites. And we sent them a private message doing the exact same treatment where say, here's some random uh, headline. How accurate do you think it is? And then we looked at what they shared in the 24 hours afterwards. And we found it significantly improved the quality of what they were retweeting. Um, so uh, this is kind of like the background for what I want to talk to you about today. This is what we've you know, spent the last four years doing or whatever. Yeah, quick question. I, I, know I, I think I know the answer to this, but I've forgotten. Do you know how long this inoculation tends to last? And I know you get this question a lot. Yes. So this is a, an important question that is very hard to answer in the survey experiment context. Because like, you know, uh, when we have them come and do the survey experiment, the experiment takes five minutes or something like that. And we don't see evidence of decay over the course of the five minutes uh, that they're doing the experiment. But like, you know, uh, that's, that's not that impressive. But the Twitter field experiment, you did track it. Right? right. So in the field, the, the, with the Twitter field experiment, uh, we used, in order to do the causal inference in a clean way, we used what's called like a stepped wedge or randomized rollout design where everyone got the treatment, but you randomized who got the treatment on each day. So each day, like another chunk of people get the treatment. And so that means like, and then you compare like in that day the people that you know, that got it to the people that didn't get it. Um, but it means that for, for the first 24 hours, you have data from everyone. But for each 24 hours out, you get less and less data because you have less of a control condition to compare to. So basically, we weren't, we weren't well powered to look beyond 24 hours there. But one of the key insights from what I'm going to talk about today uh, pertains to this. Okay. So, let's, so let's return to that uh, in a bit. Mm -hmm. It matters if the headline is presented with a, a picture or a video. Yeah. So in this particular context, we haven't like crossed the accuracy prompt with whether there is a picture there or not. But we have some done some experiments. We had some old stuff uh, published on this, and Zivi ran some experiments like a year ago that we never wound up writing up. We also did like uh, headline without picture, headline with picture, um, and it didn't really make much difference. Um, which was contrary to our expectations, but yeah. My own facilities, people were not allowed to like use external resources. They just saw the problem and that was it. Or were people allowed to be like, wait, we Google this too? Uh, so we didn't tell them not to, but in these survey experiments, nobody cares enough okay. to do that. <laughs> You know, whereas in, on, in, the twi in the Twitter field experiment, who really knows what people are doing? They're just out there in the world doing their thing. But my sense is most people don't care enough, even in real life, to Google things to find out if they're true or not. But it's more you're scrolling by and you're like, oh, that looks funny. All right, I'll retreat it, whatever. And I should say that as someone that studies this and spends all my time thinking about this, I have done this myself, where I know at least once I retweeted something because I thought it was like amazing. And then like a couple of hours later, one of my colleagues re like responded and said, is that actually true? And I was like, oh, I did the thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that, that your question does highlight uh, one of the real limitations of all of this stuff, which is, well, I guess the, which is the, the sort of focus of what I want to talk about today, which is there's a ton of this evidence from survey experiments where the outcome is sharing intentions. People are in this artificial lab context where they're clicking through uh, you know, uh, Qualtrics surveys, and on each page being like, well, how likely would it be to share it? How likely would it be to share it? And like, uh, you know, we've done some other work that suggests that these self-report sharing intentions are meaningfully related to what people actually do in the world. But the question is, if we really were going to do this at scale on platform, what would happen? Like, how you know, how well would this actually work in the wild? And so that's what I want to talk about, um, and. Uh, the, so the question is, like, how could we deliver this at scale? Obviously, if we were technology, like if we were meta, we could just build lots of things into the platform that are always reminding people about accuracy. Um, but that requires a lot of uh, you know, engineering lift. And so we wanted to figure out, like, 
as a, as a, not as the, the, the vision of this is the ultimate implementation, but as a way to, in a minimal effort uh, way, test this at scale, what could we do? And the answer that we came up with is ads. Um, and a lot of the way that we came to this idea, actually, is some nonprofits got in, that, that do like um, you know, election integrity type stuff uh, got interested in this work. And um, so they hired a design company to make a series of ads based on our research. Um, and then uh, during the 2020 election, uh, they paid, they like bought a lot of ad space on disinformation websites with these kinds of ads, and they found that they were getting way more engagement than their typical persuasive ads. Um, and then so during the Georgia, uh, like the runoffs, they like spent a ton of money, like millions of dollars, putting these ads all over everything, got tens of millions of impressions. And based on a survey experiment we, made, we ran on YouGov, there's reason to think that this reduced the sharing of misinformation, but like, you know, they were not doing credible causal inference about like they were just running an ad campaign. Uh, and so we wanted to know, okay, like let's do this for real. Let's try and do like a real randomized experiment using these kinds of ads and see what happens. And uh, sort of like, okay, why do we think that this might work? Um, well, as maybe is not surprising, given that that's the whole business model of the whole of the social media, uh, there is evidence that social media ads work. Um, uh, and so there was this big meta-analysis um, of uh, more than 600 ad experiments on Facebook. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, they found that, like, uh, in general, like, the median ad campaign increased uh, sales, like, bottom-of-the-funnel outcomes, as they say in marketing, uh, by about 5%. Um, in the public health context or like the public policy context, uh, there was this paper that did a meta-analysis of like all of the COVID vaccine public health like PSA type experiments that are that were run on or like campaigns that were run on Facebook and Instagram, and they found an average of about a one percent improvement in attitudes towards COVID vaccines as a result of uh, you know being an ad campaign, uh, and then there was this paper. Uh, by the people at Acronym, which was this uh, nonprofit that um, was started by a bunch of people that left uh, what was at that time Facebook uh, to go try and do election integrity stuff. And so they basically were doing pro-Biden uh, persuasive ad campaign that they spent millions of dollars on and it lasted eight months. Uh, and it decreased turnout and they had assessment where they had a randomized holdout group and stuff like that. And they found that the ad campaign reduced turnout among likely Trump voters by 0.3 percentage points and increased turnout among likely Biden uh, voters by 0.4 percentage points. So the point is, uh, I guess what I think the key take home from this is uh, social media ad campaigns can move behavior. And these are the kind of magnitudes of effect that you should expect if things are working the way you know, we hope they would work. And so we want to know, can accuracy prompt ads reduce misinformation sharing online? And what we uh, did in this paper, and what I'm going to spend the rest of the time telling you about, is two experiments that we ran. One run on Facebook and run, one run on Twitter um, that are uh, both involve using accuracy prompt ads uh, to showing accuracy prompt ads to people and looking at the effect on their sharing of misinformation. Uh, and beyond that, they are different in every other regard. <laughs> so they are, they are, complement, they are complementary. Um, I'll start with the Facebook experiment. Uh, so this is an experiment that was conducted by researchers at Meta, um, plus Nils Wernerfeld, who is a professor at uh, Northwestern now, but was at Meta at the time. Um, and I was sort of like, was the external person that worked with them to design the experiment. But they actually ran it and analyzed the data and so on. Um, and so we recruited 33 million Facebook users, uh, which was a general population sample, plus uh, because you know misinformation sharing is actually not very prevalent. Um, and so to, to try to increase the amount of signal that we would have, uh, upsampled 350,000 users who had shared misinformation links about two months before we ran the experiment, which is the time at which they sort of selected the, the user set. Um, and then people were randomly assigned to either a control or to treatment, and the people within the treatment 
uh, were randomized into one of three different treatment arms that had used different creatives, but uh, you know, whichever arm they were within, within the treatment, basically what it translated into is they got about three ads uh, where the normal ad that Meta would have showed them was replaced with an accuracy prompt ad. Um, it's about, happened about, for about three ads over the course of three weeks. So roughly one ad per week, um, which is not very much, um, and we will return to that. <laughs> Uh, but um, so they, they showed them these ads, and the ads were meta branded. And so this is what they looked like. Um, people in one arm got one of these three sets of digital literacy tips. And like the other ones, I don't think they're really teaching anything because it says like two tips for thinking critically before sharing an article. And then it's got some small thing down here that I think nobody reads. And so the point is, you, what you get from this is think critically. <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, when you share an article, how important is that it's accurate? 80% of Americans think it's important to only share accurate things. Some stories contain emotional language, check for accuracy, uh, this, this sort of thing. So they get one of these ads, and then we want to know how much uh, bad stuff are they sharing. And <clears throat> the key outcome, obviously, is going to be, like, are they sharing posts that are misinformation? And how much does the sharing of misinformation posts compare control versus treatment? Um, and so the key question in all of this research always is, how do you define what counts as misinformation? And so in this, uh, for this experiment, we had three signals. The first is things that professional third-party fact-checkers flagged as, as false or misleading. Um, another thing is Facebook has this, uh, this program called Community Review, where they have a representative group of Facebook users that reviews content, basically that does like sort of crowd-based fact-checking. We have a whole other line of work on that, incidentally. And I should just say crowds are remarkably good at identifying misinformation. And with you know, we found that a crowd of maybe 15 or 20 people can get as much agreement with fact-checkers as fact-checkers have amongst uh, themselves. Um, so and we've got the crowd signal. And then Facebook has a, or Meta has a classifier for Facebook that um, you know, tries to predict what's misinformation or not. And so we've got all three of these signals. Uh, and, you know, of course, the caveat here is this is an estimate of what's misinformation and what's not misinformation. It's very far from perfect, but I'd say it's much better than most past work and the Twitter experiment that I'll talk about in a minute, where um, if you don't have a classifier the way that, you know, the way, mis the way sort of meta has on hand, what almost everybody else does is they just use the domain as a proxy for quality and say, oh, well, from its, if it's from the New York Times, it's, we're going to count it as true. If it's from InfoWars, we're going to count it as false. And you know, that's the best we can do. So here we're doing better than that, because it's at least something about the actual post. And also, it's not restricted to URLs. This is any post uh, you know, goes in there. Mm -hmm. And these ads, they're always in the right? Yep. OK. And yep. does it, just depending on where the ad would have been before, that's what it is. Exactly. It's, yeah. using, it's like Facebook standard sort of like uh, brand lift type machinery where you pay to run your ad and they you know substitute it in and keep track of who saw it and then you know in the brand lift they follow up with some questionnaires here we just follow up by watching what they do so you have no control of where the ad is it's not like you don't know if it's the first thing that they see versus it's just like somewhere in the middle of the viewing experience that's right and it must almost always it's going to be the latter i think okay. and so that's another thing to, to keep in mind in interpreting all of this is undoubtedly a large fraction of the people that were treated were not actually treated and just scrolled by the ad and never looked at it. Um, and so that's also why I say, like, whatever we see here, if, if Meta wanted to do this, they could presumably produce much larger effects by making sure that the people actually saw the things. Um, so as I mentioned briefly before, uh, misinformation sharing is low on average. This is like now a well-reproduced uh, result um, across a bunch of different uh, studies, and we also find that here. So if we use all three possible flags and say if it gets any, if like the fact checker said it was bad or the crowd said it was bad or the classifier said it was bad, any of those things, we're going to call it bad. Still, uh, like in the week before the experiment, uh, only like, you know, 6.5% of users shared any bad claims at all. So 93%, 94% of people were not sharing anything bad at all. Uh, and even among the people that did share at least one problematic thing, 60% of them only shared one problematic thing. So uh, in order to get the most signal here, um, we're going to pool all the flags, say if it's flagged on any of the different misinformation things, we're going to call it misinformation. And our key outcome is just going to be a 0, 1, did the user share anything bad or not? 
um, which is essentially like doing a median split on misinformation sharing. It's going to be like no versus yes. Um, and we basically just have one observation per user, which is like during whatever window we're looking at, did they share anything bad? And we're going to compare treatment versus control. And David, sorry. Yeah. What, what is, uh, I missed it. What is pooling all possible files? Uh, that is whether it's uh, flagged by third party fact checkers, by community review, or by the classifier. If any of those things are true, we're going to say it's one. And if none of them are true, we're going to say it's a zero. Okay. And are you only looking at the six ish percent that, that shared something? Well, well again, I'm going to start by looking at everyone, and then I'm going to subset on the six percent, and things will look better. Um, who's that? Um, are they just via yeah, news headlines or misinformation kind of embedded in other ways, like memes and things like it's that? It's everything. And unlike most other work where you have to rely on the domain classification and therefore it's only URLs, here it's just like all posts uh, that are, you know, that are identified. Um, so, okay, so what happened? Uh, I'm going to start by just looking at the effect within the Facebook browsing session in which the ad was delivered, either the treatment or the control ad. Um, and to do this, I'm going to look at the 60 minutes, uh, what people share in the 60 minutes uh, following the first you know, prompt or, non or control ad that they got. Um, and <clears throat> like about 80% of users are no longer active after 60 minutes. Um, and uh, what we find is a 1.8% reduction in the probability of being a misinformation sharer in the treatment uh, relative to the control. So, uh, you know, that's, that's something. Um, but as per the question before, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really make sense to be looking at the 93.5% of people that probably weren't going to share anything bad anyways. Um, like, if the person was not going to share any misinformation, <clears throat> giving them a prompt is not going to help. Uh, and so if we only subset on the people who shared something uh, pre-treatment, <clears throat> that shared something bad pre-treatment, we get, you know, okay, a 2.6% decrease in their probability of being a misinformation sharer, and you get totally no effect at all among the users that didn't share anything pre-treatment, <clears throat> which again sort of makes sense and is in line with, you know, what you would expect. Um, and so in what I'm going to tell you next, I'm just going to focus on that 6.5% of people that actually shared some misinfo pretreatment. Um, we don't really find, uh, we don't find any significant difference across the three different types of prompts that we showed them, uh, which is consistent with uh, what Zivi found in survey experiments, where like compared a whole bunch of different prompts and they all basically equal, work equally well, as long as you're directing people's attention to accuracy, like great. Um, and <clears throat> we didn't find any uh, interaction between the treatment and a bunch of different covariates. That is to say, it was equally effective uh, regardless of user gender, age, uh, or education. And age is a particularly notable one because of previous work, and I think we replicate this here, finds that old, like people over 65 are substantially more likely to share misinformation. And so if this didn't work on those people, that would be a problem. But there's no significant interaction. And to the extent that there is one, it's directionally in the direction of a bigger effect for the old people. So that's good. So just to clarify, so the older folks are still sharing more. Uh, but this this is this is helping them perhaps more, right? At least as much as the other people, but maybe more even. Exactly. That'd be amazing. Exactly. Um, and and then uh, this is also consistent with what we find in the survey experiments, where we don't find much moderation of this effect. It seems to work, uh, you know, pretty well for pretty much everyone, or pretty equally for everyone. Um, we also don't any, find any effect on sharing of non-misinformation content, because that's another problem is like, say this reduced misinformation sharing, but it reduced all other kinds of sharing too, then the tech companies would be like, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, which maybe they say anyways, but you know, it's a different issue. Uh, so there's no significant effect on the total number of, uh, of posts, excluding misinformation posts. Um, if you do an equivalent model looking at the number of misinfo posts, there is a significant decrease in the number of misinfo posts, and the interaction is significant. So it's saying this effect on misinfo posts is significantly smaller than the effect on non-misinfo posts. So evidence that it's, the effect is specific to the kinds of posts that we actually want to reduce the sharing of. <clears throat> uh, OK, so that was in the, you know, the, for the 60 minutes after you get the first uh, treatment. What about over the full three weeks of the campaign? Um, 
maybe not surprisingly, there's no significant effect. Um, but like, remember, they're only getting about one prompt a week. Uh, and you know, if this is about redirecting attention, it seems to me it's sort of unreasonable to expect that uh, you get a little thing that prompts you to think about, that focuses your attention on accuracy. That session, you log off, you go live your life, you do all kinds of other things, and then the next time you log on, you're not still thinking about accuracy. You're, you know, whatever else happened to you. Um, and so the, you know, and also ad effects are small in general and sharing over three weeks the high variance outcome. So the question is, what happens if instead of just doing one a week, we prompted people a lot more regularly? And so this brings us to the Twitter experiment. And uh, the Twitter experiment was run by us uh, with no help uh, from Twitter. Um, <laughs> uh, and House Lin is this great postdoc in my group who is the technical lead on this stuff. Um, and uh, what I'm going to show you is the results of pooling three different experiments that we ran. Um, that is like essentially like three different rounds of data collection. In the first one, we uh, sampled uh, about 33,000 users who had shared links to low-quality uh, domains um, you know, uh, in the week before we ran the experiment. Um, and here, the domain quality, which I guess I'll talk about in the next slide in more detail. But basically, we've got these fact checker ratings of thousands of domains, and we use those as our metric of, of quality. Um, and the second experiment uh, focused on people that were sharing hashtags related to a particular conspiracy theory driven uh, like COVID protest of Canadian truckers. Uh, because my, two of my co-authors were Canadian, got money from Canada, and had to do something Canadian. So we're like, all right, great, there we go. <laughs> uh, but something that's nice about this one is because it was hashtag related for this experiment, uh, we didn't have to use the domain proxy, but we could specifically look at how many of these hashtags are people sharing. Um, and then the third one, we collected people that had related, shared content uh, related to sort of deep uh, state conspiracy theories. And uh, then we're going to run uh, regression models separately for each experiment and then combine them with a, like a random effects meta-analysis. Um, and uh, we randomly assigned half the users to control, half the reasons to treatment, and we did block randomization on a bunch of these different covariates to make sure that the blocks were balanced, which gives you like a more precise estimate. Um, and uh, the people that were assigned to the treatment, they were used as a custom audience in an ad campaign on Twitter. Um, and uh, you know, unlike the Facebook experiment where the prompting was very uh, infrequent, here we basically just said, show them as many ads as possible and we will pay you. We had like a hard time paying Twitter. We were like, we, we were, show them more ads. We want them to pay them. We'll pay you more money. Just show them more ads. And so we said, you know, full throttle, whatever. And what it came out was is on average, people saw 2.9 accuracy prompts per day every day for the duration of the, of the campaign. Um, but we didn't want people to start ignoring them. If you show this person the same ad again and again, people will be like, well, I saw that, I'm going to ignore it. So we had a sample, like a set of 50 different creatives, and we're just randomly sampling from that uh, set so that people uh, wouldn't ignore it. Um, and unlike the Facebook experiment where they were Facebook-branded ads, these were not Twitter-branded ads. They were branded with our own account. And so they looked things like this. Our account is called uh, Think Accuracy. Um, and you know, is, is the news you're sharing accurate? Every single one of us can tell true from false. Trust your judgment. Think first. Share second. Whatever. Um, some of them, you know, were these kind of video ads. Some of them were the kind of like poll ad, uh, like what we've done in the survey experiments of like, is this true or not? Also, this one has a picture of a butt, so that's probably good for attention. You know, <laughs> uh, there's these like kind of minimal digital literacy tips, which again, I don't think is really you know helping anyone. Uh, you know, learn and it's not teaching anything anybody useful. It's just making them think about accuracy. Um, and uh, so, in this study, the we don't have like a post level classifier, so we have to do the standard uh, misinformation thing, misinformation research thing, which is uh, use the domain as a proxy for information quality. Um, and so, we're going to call something a misinformation retweet if it's a retweet of a tweet that contains a URL that links to a low quality news site. Um, and we're going to define low quality as below 70 out of 100 on some particular like master list of um, uh, expert ratings. Well, we have this paper uh, in PNAS Nexus last year where uh, House looked at six different sets of expert ratings and showed there was a high degree of 
uh, sort of agreement across them and created a consensus master list that has like 6,000 domains in it or something like that. Um, and the results are not specific to this particular threshold. We show that you can pick the threshold in lots of different places and you get pretty much the same result. Uh, and uh, you know, obviously, as I said, now we're doing the sort of domain level rather than post level because we're going to have huge numbers of tweets and we don't have a good classifier of our own to use. So here we are. Um, and this is except for the Canadian trucker uh, protest study where we're going to count the number of hashtags they retweeted uh, and from this specific set of hashtags that had to do with this conspiracy theory. Um, and uh, so what we're going to do is for each user day, we are going to look at the number of misinformation uh, posts they retweeted in that user day. And we're going to predict that based up for a dummy for whether in their treatment or the control. Um, and uh, you know we do various other things. Like there's some outliers. There are a few people that are sharing a huge number of uh, things. So we Windsorize. So basically, everything above the 95th percentile is set to the 95th percentile. Uh, so you don't have the outliers skewing the model result. Um, we have fixed effects for date and for uh, block randomized block to control for just like overall variation across days and across types of users. We control for the user's pre-treatment uh, level of misinformation sharing because that's highly predictive of their during the thing information sharing. Um, and as I said, we we'll do estimates for each of the three different experiments and then combine them with a meta regression. Okay, so what happened? Uh, First, I'm going to show you just the average effect over all users in the treatment versus all users uh, in the control. And I'm going to show you the percent change in the number of links to low quality domains that the people in the treatment had relative to the control. So negative is good because that means you're getting a decrease in the sharing of misinformation. Um, and uh, on average, the, the meta analytic result is in black and each of the three separate experiments is in blue. So we have remarkably similar estimates across the three experiments. And overall, it's about a 3.7% decrease in sharing of uh, low quality links. <clears throat> so um, fine, uh, good. Um, and here, they're all, these are all people that were actively active misinformation sharers. So we don't have any you know, uh, issue there like we did in the first experiment. But something that is a, a feature of the Twitter ads uh, infrastructure is they don't show the ad to all the people that you want them to show the ad to. Um, and in this case, they said 60% of the people in our custom audience actually got shown ads. But of course, they don't tell you which 60% because they don't want you to, you know, privacy uh, you know, concerns and so on. So this main analysis is just kind of like assuming everyone saw it, even though that we know only 60% of the people saw it. But you can do an instrumental variables uh, approach. It's like a standard thing uh, from econ where you can estimate the average treatment effect on the treated. Um, say, like basically, among the people that actually saw it, we don't know which ones, but uh, you can say, what would the effect be? Uh, and so among people that saw at least one ad, we'd estimate that there was about a 6.3% decrease in uh, the number of bad links uh, shared. Sorry, what's your instrument here? <clears throat> uh, assignment to condition. Basically, it's like the people, you, you like instrument whether you saw an ad or not based on where you assigned to the treatment like to see the ad. It's like a standard, it's basically a standard approach for dealing with noncompliance, in particular sort of one-sided noncompliance where you know no one in the treatment is getting it and you know some people in the treatment got it and some people didn't. Essentially, like what it boils down to is just dividing it by one minus the fraction of the people that got the ad. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, we, like in the Facebook experiment, there's n basically we didn't find any evidence of moderation by anything. Um, it wasn't moderated by pretreatment misinformation sharing, which is different from the Facebook experiment, but here it's because everybody had a lot of misinformation. Like we selected them all to be sharing stuff beforehand, so there's just not that much variation there. Uh, there was no difference uh, in whether, based on people that were estimated to be Democrats or Republicans, based on who they shared, so that's good. Um, there was no difference based on whether they were people that were politically engaged or not politically engaged. Uh, there was no difference based on the person's number of followers, which is good because if this worked for people that didn't have any followers but didn't work for people that had a lot of followers, that would obviously uh, not be great, but it seemed to work as well, and if anything, directionally slightly better for the people that had more followers. Um, 
And to your question about persistence, we also did a thing where we interacted the treatment effect with the day number of the campaign. Was it the first day of the campaign, the second day of the campaign, and so on? And we didn't find any significant interaction at all, uh, suggesting that the, we didn't find evidence that the treatment effect decayed over subsequent days. And so I guess that's more, that's not so much about how long does an individual prompt la last, but it's more of do people start ignoring them? Yeah, 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 exactly. Which was a real concern for us. It's like habituation. Right, exactly. And I think the reason we were not getting habituation here is because we had this big set of creatives, and it's not like we were showing them the same thing again and again. We were showing them lots of different ads that all had the same message, but were like very diverse. And so I think that's an important lesson of, for any kind of social media intervention is, uh, people start ignoring things real fast. Like banner blindness is a huge problem, and so you have to design in a way that you know doesn't have that problem. Um, <clears throat> and also, like the Facebook experiment, we found no significant effect on sharing of non-misinformation posts, and we found that the effect was significantly uh, more negative for misinfo posts compared to non-misinfo posts. So again, it's the evidence that it's specific to the bad posts. <clears throat> Um, finally, we also had a fourth uh, Twitter experiment where the people that we uh, targeted were largely inactive users. So these were people that had not shared any low quality links in the three weeks before the experiment, but had shared at least one longer in the past. Um, most of these people didn't tweet anything at all uh, in the pre-treatment days, and not surprisingly, it didn't do anything for these people. Um, and this experiment, like the effect here, was significantly different than the three that did target uh, active sharers. Um, and again, this is sort of emphasizing the importance of targeting this at the people who are actually uh, the problem and not the people that are not doing anything anyways. Um, <clears throat> so that's, the, that's what we did. Um, and to wrap up, I just want to sort of contextualize these effect sizes. So uh, you know, remember, what motivated this whole thing is all these ex survey experiments we ran where we showed people hypothetical social media feeds and asked for their sharing intentions. And in that context, we know exactly which posts are true and which posts are false, because we pick them and we have complete control. We know exactly what people are exposed to. We know everyone receives the treatment because we give it to them. Um, and there, we're getting about a 9 to 10% decrease in sharing intentions. And in the real field study, where uh, you know, there's all these problems, like as, as you asked earlier, like probably most people didn't even see the ad. There's just another ad in the feed that you scroll right by. So probably a lot of people didn't get the treatment. There's this imperfect measurement of which uh, outcomes they're sharing are actually misinformation or not. Um, there's also potentially interference effects, which is to say, if the people in the treatment are sharing less stuff, it's possible that people in the control were therefore seeing less stuff and also sharing it. My guess is there's not much interference because the effects aren't that big, but you know, whatever. This is all reasons that you should expect the field experiment to be smaller than the survey experiment. And I was actually extremely pleasantly surprised that the difference was a factor of two to three rather than a factor of like 10 to 100 or something like that. So I think the effect sizes compare uh, favorably to the survey experiments. And also, this like two to 6% is in line with the ad experiments that I told you in the beginning, that in general, these sort of social media ad experiments are effects on uh, roughly this size. Um, and then something that we don't capture in this experiment, but if you imagine that this was happening in the world, uh, what the, the real impact would be bigger than this because, first of all, there's network effects, like I was saying a minute ago. If I don't share it, my followers don't see it, none of them share it, and so on. And also to the extent that your sharing behavior, even if you don't have very many followers, your sharing behavior is informing the algorithm about what content is interesting and what content it should show to people. That also can, uh, you know, if you take that into account, it can amplify these effects. Um, and as I, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, um, we're just using the ad delivery platform because it was convenient, but you could do things that make sure that people actually see the ads, and then you presumably would get bigger effects. So I think overall the idea is these are meaningful effects, um, but you know, if you're a platform, uh, you're balancing the effect of this against costs, like if you're replacing ads with, other ad with these things, you're, it's costing you ad revenue. So another reason that probably ads are not a good way to do this uh, you know, if you're actually meta. Um, so to conclude, uh, I think this is evidence that accuracy prompts can actually reduce me uh, misinformation sharing in a meaningful way in real field experiments at scale on platforms. So this is like a real thing that could actually work. Um, and these interventions are content neutral. You don't have to know ahead of time what is the bad content. 
um, and so it fills this important gap left by the sort of content-specific uh, treatments that are the current mainstay of you know, anti-misinformation interventions. Um, and here we have this convergent evidence from an uh, experiment on Twitter and an experiment on Facebook that are different in all of their details uh, despite having the same overall goal. So that sort of convergent evidence you know, makes me more confident uh, in the result. Um, and I think one of the key practical implications is it's not enough to show somebody an accuracy prompt once and then go away. Like, if you want this to work, you need to have a sustained redirecting of attention. And, you know, I think the platforms have created an environment where a default, the attention is on not accuracy. And so there needs to be some kind of, like, uh, regular or continual efforts to get people to be thinking about accuracy if you want this to work. But fortunately, it looks like people don't just start tuning it out. So that should actually be possible to do sustained uh, redirection of, of attention. And also, it's important to only target users that you would expect to share misinformation, um, largely so you're not wasting a lot of time and effort treating all of these people for whom it's you know, not useful. Um, although that uh, you know, means that the, the treatment is content neutral, but it's not user neutral. And so you still need to be doing, you need to have some information about who are the people that are potentially problematic and then target them, so which has some practical issues and also potentially uh, is something that people could feel is discriminatory. Uh, although I would argue relative to all other kinds of interventions, it's, it's, I don't think it's a very strong case to, to make that this is discriminatory because you're not forcing anybody to do anything. You're just helping people actualize their actual preferences, which is like not sharing things that are inaccurate. Um, or also you could do this in times of crisis where you have likely to think that most people might be sharing inaccurate things because there's a lot of it out there or whatever. Um, and again, just to reiterate, we used ads for simplicity of, uh, of designs, but there are other modes of delivering this uh, that could likely generate larger effects. So thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to all of the many people that worked on this. These are the folks on the Meta side and the folks on the MIT and Gord's at Cornell side. Uh, so thanks a lot and looking forward to questions. Oh, yeah, and all the people that gave us money also. <laughs> you would like to ask questions or give him money? <laughs> <laughs> Always interested in both. Uh, no money, just a question. Um, next. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. So I don't know what's the best, right? But the things that seem like they would likely be good were you could imagine like a banner. You could imagine when you first uh, open it, like the first thing at the top of your feed is like an accuracy. Uh, you could also do interstitials sometimes where then people will certainly see it, but that they might find annoying. Um, uh, so I, th I think those are the, the most obvious uh, alternatives to me. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that would be great. And I think that, the, uh, like, the, obviously you would want to design it in such a way that the important content happens in the first five seconds. Um, but 100%, I think that the, that's actually an advantage of the video-based platforms is people are much more used to being forced to watch things, uh, at least for some amount of time. So, yeah, I think that that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier how one of the early decisions that users make is this tension between the social concerns and accuracy concerns and the accuracy concerns and kind of getting, getting uh, enveloped by the social concerns. Um, what happens when those kind of like more directly at odds, right? Like, whereas just randomly seeing a misinformation headline, someone might share it because there's no network effect stake there, but there's a different decision to be made when it's your friend sharing something um, and you can have to decide between the in group or the social cue versus the accuracy decision. It's a good question. So we can't really speak to that from the survey experiments because we don't you know, we, we don't really have that. The closest thing that we have there is looking at whether it's aligned with your politics or not. And so we find that the prompts are actually more effective for headlines that are aligned with your politics and that you're motivated to share than headlines that you aren't. But most of that is just because nobody shares headlines that are not aligned with their politics anyways. So there's not really anywhere to move. Um, but it does certainly work even for things that you're, like, motivated to share. Um, and in terms of the, like, identity of, like, oh, my friend shared it, 
I actually, it's not totally clear to me which way that cuts, because the question is like, is your friend authoritative? And you know, I think it's more like if your political elite, you know, if your if like the, you know your uh, preferred presidential candidate shares something, that I think you know certainly has an effect on people's judgments. And we're actually about to run an experiment testing that, where we cross the accuracy prompt thing with whether there's a leader cue or not. But my hope is it still works. Oh. Mm -hmm. For a long time, and maybe still true, uh, Nextdoor was doing a thing where every time you tried to post, it would say, stop and think, is this kind and non-discriminatory and whatever? And um, I don't know, I roll my eyes at it. But <laughs> I wonder if you have any comments about the effectiveness that they might have found or not found for that, or whether you would recommend uh, um, intervention right before you post every time, just you know, think, is this accurate? Yeah, so uh, I didn't actually know that Nextdoor did that. That is good to know. Um, I know Twitter did a sort of similar thing where if you tried to retweet something without reading it, it would be like, do you want to read this before you tweet it? Mm -hmm. And my take on both of those is, a baseline, it's a great idea, but the problem is the banner blindness, because it's the same every time. Like for me, the first time I got one of those things from Twitter of like, do you want to retweet this other reading? I was like, oh man, well, I guess I should think about it. And after about three or four times, it was like, oh, I just have to click twice before I share <laughs> instead of once. Uh, and so that's my, my guess about that is I, I bet when they first rolled that out, it did have an impact on what people are doing. And now I bet people start ignoring it pretty quickly. And so, you know, I guess that's a, a recurring theme here is Whatever, however you do this, or however they do it, it needs to be done in a way that's varied and so people don't ignore. But I think intervening at the time of sharing is very natural. Um, it's just a question of how to do it in a way that keeps attention. Yeah, a great question. We haven't done that. Um, it would be straightforward to do in the paradigm that we have. Um, and it would be interesting. I'm not sure what I would predict in that, like, uh, you know, on the one hand, you might predict, oh, well, if they're emotionally aroused, then they're going to be more resistant to this. But on the other hand, if they're more emotionally aroused, there may be a bigger disconnect between the accuracy judgments and the sharing attention in the first place, such that like, if you get them to think about accuracy, you get a bigger effect. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I would like to see what happens, and I don't know the answer. But I guess I, what I would take from the field experiments is, at least on average, for people that are out in the world, it seems to be working for a lot of people. Because that, that would be one of the reasons you might worry it wouldn't work in the field relative to the survey experiment. Mm -hmm. And, and also, this is fantastic that Facebook studies overcome so many of the limitations, like actual disinformation rather than domains. Um, my two questions are this. The first is you really have a strong attentional account. This is all about attention. And that requires sustained prompting. Mm -hmm. Do you see any um, space for maybe more of an endogenous approach like education? Or do you really think that, sorry, social media is just so distracting because I'll just pull in attention, that's the only account. That would be my first one. I guess that uh, my, we haven't directly tested that, although we had some things in the works that whatever happened. Uh, but uh, my hypothesis about it is, um, so the accuracy prompts only work in so much as the underlying accuracy judgments are accurate. So like, if education can help people do a better job of telling what's true from false, that will make the accuracy prompting work better. But I think that if, even if people are very good at telling true from false, if they're not paying attention, it's not going to help that much. And so I see like a synergy between education approaches and the kind of attentional approaches. I mean, and there's at least some evidence in support of that account. We have a paper on digital literacy, uh, like a correlational paper. <clears throat> we find that digital literacy is quite predictive of um, accuracy judgments, where people that are higher on various different measures of media and digital literacy are better at telling true from false when you ask them about accuracy, but it's not correlated with sharing discernment when you ask about what they would share. Again, because I think that there's, you know, this as I said, like I've done it myself. Um, and so, it, yeah, 
that that would be my take. And I th and I think a lot of the experiments that test some of the like educational interventions and like inoculations and stuff like that, often what they will do is they will ask people about the accuracy of the headline and whether they would share it on the same page. Um, and then they'll get things that look like effects on sharing. But it's because they already prompted accuracy by asking them whether it was accurate or not. Like we have other experiments, like Zivi has a paper in Science Advances that shows that if you ask people accuracy and sharing, you get a totally different uh, pattern of results than if you just ask them about sharing, because asking them to judge the accuracy is a maximum strength accuracy prompt. The other thing I just want to say, too, is this may be more of a meta thing, is a huge finding in your work here is like how little misinformation is out there, right? And yet, like, look at all these people funding the work and, and our work here. And so I guess I'm, I'm just wondering, like, how are you thinking about the way your work, for example, is conveyed to the public? Because I just, one of my worries is that everybody thinks misinformation is everywhere, and that undermines belief in actual real news, or even things that actually doesn't matter, like you were saying. So, so how, as, as a field or, or an area of work that we're in, how do we convey this? Because you know, hopefully this gets covered, it gets lots of attention, but it will not be about how there was really only 6% of people shared misinfo. It'll be about how to fix misinfo. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, first of all, uh, it's these, you know, so we have this here, but this is something that, like, I feel like within the academic community is well established at this point. Like, the, you know, Brendan Nyhan and Andy Guest had a couple of these papers looking at, <clears throat> uh, I think they did Facebook and website visits, and then the David Lazar's group had the people on Twitter, like, sharing of Twitter on, uh, in the, uh, misinfo on Twitter in the 2016 election, and they all have this consistent result where it's around 5% of the people, and they usually find it's concentrated in old Republicans. Um, and so uh, there is this disconnect between that and the public perception of, oh, everything is misinformation everywhere. And it has been an interesting experience watching the misinfo researchers constantly arguing against their self-interest, or at least some people, the people that I think are like the very credible people, being like, look, it's really not as big a problem as you guys all think it is, but still I you know, should fund my research on it. Uh, but, but I think that, that another issue is that we don't know what people are seeing. right? All of those measures are sharing. And we know that only a small fraction of people share anything. Like, most people are lurkers. Um, and so I think that exposure is potentially a lot larger than what you're getting from those share counts. And like, Meta has that data. We couldn't put it in the paper. But uh, I think it's important data to have in the world. And I'm talking to people about like trying to uh, do a paper around the difference between sharing and exposure. Um, and so it is, it is possible that exposure is substantially larger than sharing. I see. So the 6% you found in your Facebook study was just people that shared, not right. about exposure. Right. And so your estimate is exposure is some number larger than 6%. Yes. Right. We're about at time. So maybe this will be the last one. Oh, yeah. I guess I'll just, um, so I guess it's just a broader question about misinformation. So like, it's always seemed to be focused on, like, and I guess this kind of falls my question. Like, it's always focused on, like, political like ads and like elections and stuff and I guess COVID now but like are we missing other forms of misinformation do you think there's a lot more information or does that capture like the mass amount of information yeah yeah it's a great point like uh, I think because it was the 2016 election cycle I mean there have been some fairly small number of people that have been working on misinformation since before it was cool and a lot of those people working on like health misinformation, cancer misinformation, supplements misinformation, like a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, and also there's a whole set of people working on fraud. And you can think of a lot of the kind of fraud phishing kind of stuff as a kind of uh, misinformation, um, you know, commercial fraud, uh, things like that. Um, and I feel like there has been a ton of attention on the election stuff, uh, or let's say the political stuff and COVID. And I do think it is important to look at other kinds of things, and that's a direction that we're going, um, trying to expand out. I'm optimistic that a lot of the findings that we find here will generalize, because I think it's a fundamental aspect of like about how people think about sharing, rather than something specific to the kind of content that they're sharing. And the fact that the COVID and the politics look the same. Even we ran a study like the first week of lockdown, so before COVID really got very politicized, and it looked basically exactly the same as the political stuff. Thank you, David, for joining us. Thanks so much. <laughs>